welcome everyone uh, to another community call. Uh, let's start with the first topic on the agenda. Patrick, would you, would you be okay with introducing the V2 of the RSC reward? Yeah, absolutely. So just a little bit of context here. Um, on Research Hub now, essentially tokens are distributed in like a very uh, V1 kind of way. Um, for every upvote a paper receives, the person who posted it receives one research coin. And so th this is a good way to just get things started. But, uh, you know, it's not a reward scheme that can scale or really set like incentives. I think that will help to grow research hub or cause like, you know, healthy research behaviors coming out of it. So um, kind of like part of this project, we'll be iterating on the reward scheme forever because as like dynamics in the community change, as more people come in, um, different incentives are going to be at play. And so we always have to be conscious of like, what we're rewarding and thinking about how to make it better so that way we can essentially incentivize the community to be more effective as a whole. So this is again like a, a very early version. It's an improvement on the V1, um, but like that is to be said over time this will like change drastically most likely. Um, and so the concept here is when you have one vote or one uh, RSC per upvote, it's kind of like a slow emission of RSC you know, the communities at like early stages, there's not like a ton of upvotes being shared on the platform. And so just in the grand scheme of things, it's hard to kind of like, like one of my theses for Research Hub initially is that researchers would want to like share content in exchange for like five to 10 bucks worth of coins when they could go like have dinner or something after work, like if they have a free hour in the lab. And so at the current like coins per upvote ratio, it's unlikely to happen. Cause you'd have to get like what at three cents, like hundreds of upvotes on your post to be able to just go buy a beer or something after work. Um, and so the idea here is we want to essentially like have a predetermined emission of RSC. So we've talked a little bit about this like 5% per year um, type of number. And the idea is that we can distribute this like, you know, X number of coins based on the number of upvotes on the platform at any given time. So like in theory, the way this would work is there would be a bucket of RSC like available every day and would get distributed to users uh, based on how many upvotes there were in that day. Um, so I'll screen share here and kind of like show the formula of how we're thinking about it. But yeah, that's the idea where we can have like a, a set number of tokens and distribute them based on like essentially how much activity there is on the website. So this is how we're thinking about it now. Essentially, there are like five different time buckets that average out and go into like a, a weighted average. So in theory, basically, like we look at all of the upvotes that have happened in the last minute, hour, day, month, and year, and then make a weighted average of it. And that'll give us like a, a total number of upvotes that could be applied to the day's rewards that would be given out. And the concept here is that um, basically all of the rewards will be subdivided by the upvotes and there will be like a consistent stream essentially uh, being earned on the website every day. And so there are a couple of implications about this. Um, well, I think one other important part too is that initially uh, the people receiving the coins for upvotes were the poster of the paper. And now when you share a paper, essentially the authors of that paper will receive 75% of whatever tokens are given to the paper. And then the poster receives 25%. And so the idea here is that like, if you share a cool paper, like you get a pretty nice finder's fee of 25%, you know, it's, you know, nothing too shabby. But at the end of the day, most of the rewards go to the people who like actually did the work in publishing the, you know, paper. And in theory, there can be a nice little pot of research coin waiting for them for whenever they want to come claim it. So that's kind of how we're thinking of it initially. Um, does anybody have any questions? I'll end up like writing a blog that kind of like describes this in more detail and helps to go over some of the thought processes. But yeah, this is the idea here is to like, again, like these incentives are not going to be perfect, but this is going to get us closer to like a reasonable emission of research coin where like it makes economic sense for grad students to spend like an hour of their time like during their like downtime in lab on research hub. So yeah, I guess uh, to get things started, Lynn. 
Yeah, so one thing I want to say is I really like the new idea about, um, like, the authors of papers getting, like, a large portion of what's rewarded because I've actually not felt, and I've actually started largely rewarding to comments over papers because I haven't actually felt great about people just getting RSC for sharing something somebody else has done. So I think this is definitely a good thing because um, that's been like a, not just moral ambiguity, but just like, you know, they did the work, you know, not, I mean, not just legal ambiguity, but like, you know, moral ambiguity of like, you know, they should be getting, you know, something for it. So I definitely approve of that. Yeah, thank you for saying that. I totally agree. It just makes it feel more legitimate, like if the people doing the work are getting the rewards for it. Um, I guess, do you feel okay with the 75-25 split? Does that sound like a, an appropriate number? I mean, I'm okay with it. I, you know, I don't know if other people think it should be skewed even more, especially if comments are also getting rewarded. But, you know, I definitely think it's a step in the right direction. It has to be at least that. And what does everybody else think? We can always tweak it in the future, but this is kind of like a, a good first step, we think. Yeah, I think it's probably good. I think you definitely will want to tweak it in the future, though, just seeing how it, you know, ends up and how it ends, you know, how much money people end up getting as a result of that. So. I think it's likely we'll try and, like, make a habit of revisiting it every six months or so and yeah. like taking everybody's feedback and saying, hey, what should we change? And like, you know, actually implementing those changes on like some kind of regular cadence. Uh, Nick? So I just I just wanted to clarify to make sure I got this. I think it's a great idea. So is that does that mean that if, let's say I'm an author, I post, or I wrote a paper, somebody else posted it, it got tons of upvotes, that RSC would be kind of held in escrow until I kind of claimed that paper as my own? Yeah, exactly. Okay, okay, cool. I think that'll be great because it's kind of like a, a scaled reward system for scaled contribution to Research Hub too. So somebody that we would really want on the site is somebody who would have a big reward for joining the site too. So I think I think it's great. Nice, awesome. Yeah, it does it feels like we're appreciating the right people more. So it does it feels nicer. I agree with that. Uh Jeff. Uh, yeah, just like um, obviously like the idea as well. Um, one thing that to keep in mind, I guess, would be like in terms of, and I'm not sure if what Research Hub has in place already for something like this, but like cyber resistance. So making sure no one comes and starts, you know, spamming a bunch of upvotes or things like that. I don't know if we have anything in place already for that, but that's something I could see getting gamed. One thing we've talked about is um, making each user's upvotes like uh, limited. So you only get like five per day or something like this. So there's like an opportunity cost essentially on upvoting um, in order to help like make people be more judicious. I think like with that being said, it's 100% going to be spammed. Like we know this and like um, part of this is we're going to roll it out at a very low emissions rate. So in theory, like we want this to eventually get up to the 5% per year but we're gonna start it out at like half a percent per year or 0.25% per year, just to like see how it's working. And like, you know, like slowly start to scale it up if we see it's working and then like, you know, always be on the lookout for like failure modes and try and like not scale it up too quickly before like we kind of recognize the easy ways to game it and fix it. Cool. So, so Anton's got an important question here. How, how would the RSC be split among the authors of multi-author papers? Um, this is an important point, and I actually don't have the answer for you. Um, I'll check with Pat afterwards and post in the community channel. I think the way it's set up now is that it's split evenly between all the authors. So if there's like a bajillion authors, they'll all just get like, you know, one one thousandth or one one bajillionth of like the total coins. That, that's not ideal either, like in theory, right, like the first author should probably get more and it should be like, I guess, like changed, like based on contributions, but that feels tough to do. Um, another thing we can do is just like give it to the first person who claims it and then just assume that people will distribute to their co-authors on their ends. But um, yeah, it, we think it's probably safer just to split the pot among all the authors just to get started. Yeah, split them sounds good. I think this was um, where I had the concept of that uh, fractionalized NFT for each um, publication. I think it makes just so much sense because a second author could have done 40% of the work or a second author could have done 
two percent of the work i've seen that whole spectrum of things so to uh, equally distribute the funding um, based off of the percent ownership someone has on the nft of the publication i think makes sense here for just when people support the publication with rsc yeah it can, it can probably evolve in the future if we do pursue the nft around and uh, in, in the house uh, re reviewing right peer reviewing the, we could introduce some sort of contract where when people submit the paper, they establish what are the proportions of the contributions between the offers and kind of like set it in stone or in writing or in, in, in NFT in so that they consent to it. I don't feel comfortable tweaking it after the fact, right? Because they don't know, we don't know how they distributed the labor when they were publishing it. So we probably just assume the easiest equal split, I guess. Yeah, so so yeah. That's, we're thinking we'll like again start low and scale up kind of as we figure out some of these wrinkles. And so, yeah, I think Jeff, you're totally right. Like having authorship contributions in NFTs is a super compelling idea, and I think we probably will do something like that. Um, we had a board meeting uh, last Thursday, and we decided the next feature we want to try and build is like incentivized peer reviews. And so NFTs in theory would come after that, so they're probably like three to six months away. And basically what we want to do over the next six months is like dive into all the ways we could do NFTs and like think like deeply on like how to like actually do it the right way and make sure the right incentives come out of the V1. Um, so yeah, I, that is to say we'll start at like a very low rate and probably after six months, once we have more of the infrastructure built in to like do things like, you know, even more like appropriately, we can scale up the rewards to make sure that that actually happens. Um, what if we have editors, what if we have editors have access to an administrative function on the site to moderate users? Um, Arshia, can you, can you elaborate on this question? Hey, uh, hey Patrick and everyone. Yeah. I mean, I was just listening to what Jeff brought up and, you know, I thought it would be cool to have some sort of function on the, on the platform as editors, because you know, we facilitate discussions and, you know, conversations and articles and uh, all that. And then if, as we grow, if there could be an administrative panel, so maybe we can see uh, users and how many, you know, upvotes they have or, uh, you know, how many they've used or how many articles they're posting, you know, so we can kind of monitor the spam if that ever happens. And, you know, we can moderate and facilitate as needed. Yep, it's a great idea. Um, we're even thinking like as we build the peer review feature, we'll have like in theory some like stuff that editors can do to help facilitate that. So having like an editor admin dashboard, I think makes a ton of sense. And like we'll we'll pretty much rely on the editors to help like scale like the kind of human piece of research hub, you know, to like a bunch of users hopefully. And yeah, in order to do that, you definitely have to have some kind of like moderator dashboard. I, I know Reddit has some pretty good stuff where like moderators can organize themselves behind the scenes. So yeah, that'll, it, I'm not sure when that'll be in the roadmap, but we definitely like, we need editors in order to scale. So we've got to give people the tools to be able to do, you know, their jobs appropriately. Nick. Yeah. Thanks Patrick. Yep. I just, I just want to say real quick to second that, cause I think as an editor being able to have access to some sort of higher level look at the site or our, at our hub as a whole would be, would be super helpful. Yes, totally. Just, you know what any other user would see. It's a great point. Uh, we might be able to like do something more bespoke, like in the time being, like we have metrics kind of for research hub as a whole, and we could maybe do some metrics like on a hub, you know, per hub basis, just to give people like ideas of like, you know, who's commenting, like who's like contributing or whatever. Um, I think there's like a 80, 20 type of fix here that we could do. That's kind of like, like a, a light lift or lift engineering wise that could hopefully give people like a bigger picture of what they're doing. I'll take that as an action item. Right then. Along a similar line, something that I would uh, really like to see is uh, sort of like a percentage growth. I think we already discussed this, like a like kind of like a growth of the hub. Like I noticed that my my hub like kind of grew in the, the past month, but I didn't realize that uh, until I actually like took a look at number of members. So could be cool for an editor to actually like be able to keep track of that uh, and be like, maybe my content is working or is not working. 
and that should also be kind of simple uh, to, to, to keep track. So we have something super lightweight now on the editor leaderboard. Like if you go to the leaderboard and then under editors, you can set a time frame and it'll show like time frame over time frame the change in the weekly active contributors in your hub. So if you do the last week under your name, it'll say like active contributors up 10%. And so it'll do week over week looking at the um, uh, basically like weekly active contributors. Let me take a look. Oh, it might be just me, uh, but I can, I'll share a screen here to show. So if I, I I'm on the editor uh, leaderboard, Th this could just be for uh, moderators. So if you guys can't see this, let me know and I'll make sure that it gets pushed to, to everybody. But in theory, like uh, Simon shows up here, he's an editor of the longevity hub. Uh, this is looking from basically the past month. So over the past month, uh, the longevity hub has gone from I guess like, you know, maybe 25 ish to 36, something like that, like 50% growth. Um, so yeah, that's, that's basically like, you can see time frame over time frame of. Yeah, I don't have it. So I don't know if it's just, uh, because of the moderator uh, kind of role, but, uh, I don't see it. Interesting. So, um, yeah, I'll ping, I'll ping the engineering team and get them to push that so that way everybody can see it. Okay, so it's already solved. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, does anybody else have any questions here uh, before we move on to the next thing on the agenda, just uh, you know, for the sake of time? Cool. Um, yeah, so like with all this being said, like the most important thing about Research Hub is that we reward good stuff. And if we ever start rewarding bad stuff, that's not an ideal situation. So if you guys ever notice that, like feel free to ping me because that's like super high priority on my mind, making sure that the rewards like actually incentivize healthy research behaviors. And we'll pretty much need everybody criticizing all the time in order to make sure we do it right. So yeah, definitely feel free to reach out to me if you see something that like you don't like in the way the rewards are set up. All right, uh, so next up on the agenda, let's talk about Twitter spaces. Uh, Malik and I played around with Twitter spaces a little bit because several users have suggested to explore this option. And Malik, would you like to summarize our findings or should I? Uh, sh sure, I, I can or you can either way. Uh, so yeah, um, we, we did like kind of a demo play with the Twitter space about a couple of weeks ago, me and Anton. and. Uh, it has a few pros and few cons. Um, so um, the so I'll just go over the the, the the pros and cons. Like so, the main thing is uh, the pros is like it will just give us a little bit more publicity when when we have the meeting. Um, uh, ideally, it should be more like when we have like a special meeting uh, where we want like you know people more than the regular community, um, you know, who want to like join and know more about Research Hub. Um, the other thing is it is recorded, so um, if anybody wants to listen in on it, um, uh, you know, it's available for about 30 days afterwards. And then it has a live script going on. So, um, I mean, it's not perfect, but um, it does uh, give you a written, um, you know, transcript of the discussion right as it's going on. The cons mainly, the issue is that the, the interface is good for cell phone, but um, not for uh, computer. So. Um, especially if you want to be the speaker um, or um, the activity lead, then um, uh, you cannot do it through through computer. Just cannot like um, it's only uh, available on phone. Um, the second is like there is a little bit of um, delay in the voice. Um, um, you know, it's not as flawless as Google Meet that we are on. And um, the other issue is like you know if you want to share something like we have on Google Meet right now, uh, it's very easy to share it on the screen, but Again, with Twitter space is only limited to the cell phone. Um, there's not much you can like share a PowerPoint slide or anything like that. So um, yeah, that's basically it. So we, me and Anton were like just discussing like for like special occasions, if we have, um, you know, like people coming in or anything and want to like, you know, publicize it more on those times, it can be useful. But I don't think for like regular our community meetings, um, it will be as, um, as easy to use as Google Meet or even helpful, you know? Yeah, so just to reiterate, basically the only thing going for Twitter spaces in terms of 
use case for us is if we want to tap into some Twitter users' popularity, right? If we were to boost a main research account uh, follow, following, and then when it gets to a certain height, we could host an event, and that's a specific type of event. So like here, this format wouldn't be very good for Twitter space because we, we talk, many users talk at the same time, taking turns, in Twitter spaces, you only have a limited number of co-hosts. And by the way, you can only be a host or co-host or be allowed to speak at all if you are on a mobile device. So it's Omega computer unfriendly. And yeah, that's pretty much it. If we, if we, ha if we have an invited guest, perhaps that's been interviewed by one, two people, that's probably the ideal use case for Twitter spaces. Uh, and maybe perhaps the guest would post it on their account if the guest is bigger than the main re research hub account. Or I I'm guessing the majority of events will be posted on research hub uh, Twitter account instead. Go ahead, Ricardo. Uh, have you participated in any of the DSI kind of like uh, podcasts or like events on on Twitter? What's your feedback that you have from that? How many people were there? Were they actually useful for bringing in additional people? Because I think that's the kind of like what we want to keep in mind for our uh, future kind of like use cases. Because as uh, Malik said, it's not going to be useful for community calls, but maybe for like a podcast series or AMA, I kind of find it difficult because if like the author want to share some images and so on it's not going to be super easy to do on the on the phone but maybe some of the d side chatter uh kind of spaces uh could be useful to uh, take some uh i don't know information from yeah i don't know what's the biggest uh d side twitter space event you guys have seen i've done uh, like two or three of them and they're always around like like 15 to 30 people and so it's not like a ton of a ton of people, but like what I've noticed happens is it helps us like cross pollinate with other DSI projects. I think we're like not quite as out there as some of the other like DAOs around research. And so it's helpful just to like help bring awareness, you know, to Research Hub in our like, you know, in theory lowest hanging fruit, like community member wise, people who are already interested in DSI. Um, but one thing I've noticed about Twitter spaces and like, like, yeah, for, for me personally, I don't love it, but I think there's like something we could do here, which is kind of cool, is it ends up being like, I don't have a, a good term for this, but it feels like a little bit of like a therapy session where like people kind of like to individually like share their own experiences about like issues, you know, in science or like in DSI, kind of where they see it going. It's less like a, a meeting led somewhere and more like a like a community sounding board. And so something that could be really cool is like if we put together like a regular series on like like issues in academia right and like we can have individuals talk about how they've been like you know had personal negative experiences with like publishing or like writing grants or like you know getting worried about being scooped or something like that like we could we could talk about why these exist like in the traditional ecosystem and then like be like oh web3 you know like maybe we could do something to make all this better um, and I think that would be compelling as like a, like an education point for people interested um, in Web3. But yeah, what do you all think? Nathan? Uh, yeah, sorry. I just wanted to back up what Patrick was saying um, about the Twitter spaces. Um, I think one of the projects that seems to be um, quite popular on Twitter is the VitaDAO project. And I think they've benefited from having quite a regular schedule of Twitter spaces and community sort of events. Um, and I totally agree with you as well that sometimes these sort of Twitter spaces can turn into <laughs> just people offering their own, you know, shall it can't, it sometimes loses a bit of structure, I think at times. And so as a, as a listener, you don't really know what, what you're doing there and, and where it's going. I think, you know, some of the events that you've done, Patrick and, and Anton, where you've had interviews that you posted on YouTube, I think could work as Twitter spaces in the same way that, you know, the traditional clubhouse events sort of worked where you have an initial discussion which people are watching and then you have a sort of Q&A feedback session at the end or, or something like that. I don't know what other people think about that. I think I'll set up a bounty on DWork to host um, some Twitter spaces because I'm even thinking like a couple of like uh, Twitter scientists like Dr. Bick, I think would probably do it and it would be an amazing conversation. And so, 
yeah, I'll, I'll put up a bounty for somebody to organize it and host it, I think would be amazing. Yeah, I think we need to think through what, what kind of format or what kind of event would bet, best fit into the Twitter space uh, structure, I guess. Do you think it's a discussion club or AMA? Uh, yeah, I think like interviews describing the issues in science, like Dr. Bick, for instance, like she calls out like uh, academic like fraud, basically like image manipulations. And so just talking about like, why do image manipulations happen? And then you can get into perish or publish. And then you can say like, like, you know, how the incentives in science are set up in a way that like kind of causes people to do this sort of bad behavior. And then she'll research up at the end. But yeah, I think I think interviews is probably a good one where we can even bring in people outside of DSI, like cool cool scientists who have audiences like on Twitter already. I think would be really cool. Yeah, I, I agree with what Patrick said. I, I I think if you were to look at the discussion format versus the interview format, I think a discussion format works much better on an event like on a platform like this where everyone's sort of joining the discussion and there's a structure and there's like a meeting format and everyone knows what they're going into beforehand as because twitter spaces just by design mean that people join in and out for quite a while no one sets aside an hour necessarily so they'll be there for five minutes they won't really understand where they are in the in the discussion otherwise and so i i think that sort of interview format works a little bit better and i, I completely agree that um, at least in the world of medical research and in particular you know cardiovascular research that i follow um they are very very keen on discussions on twitter um it happens all the time and i'm sure I'm sure you'd be able to find many many people to get involved in that if you wanted to yeah that sounds like a wonderful out of the box d work bounty right so perhaps better structured for a person who would do the entire process from start to finish right so they would identify the key speaker invite them then host the meeting then perhaps share the recording and that would be the bounty uh, any more thoughts on the matter or should we move on All right, I'll let's talk about the ELN. How can we make the ELN more robust? What kind of features do you guys want to see in ELN uh, to make it more compelling for you to use it more frequently? And then we can also talk about how we can support the users who already use ELN and publish stuff. Maybe perhaps we could announce it on Slack better, tweet about it, make credit posts about it. For example, the, uh, the C line post that uh, was more or less recently posted. Yeah, I think one important piece of context here too is that Thomas uh, pushed the ability to add DOIs to ELN publications last Friday. So like in theory, Research Hub can kind of act as a preprint server now. Um, we'll build in peer review next. So yeah, we, we in theory like can have people like publish like manuscripts to Research Hub right now, which is kind of cool. I, I think for the ELN, what um, I mentioned this to Patrick, uh, but something like a better like categorization system on the left panel um, because for now I have just this like running list of a bunch of like separate documents that I've been piecing together some things related to my research some things related to other topics um, so I think just maybe some folder system that allows you to bucket some of your uh, broad ideas together and then um, like a, I think after that gets kind of organized better a citation uh, tool uh, integrated into it would make it pretty robust. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Those are great suggestions. Um, I bounced your, your folder idea off the team earlier today, and they're definitely thinking in that direction to help make it like actually useful, you know, if you have like 100 different notes or something in the ELN. Elaine, you had a hand? It was a mistake. Okay. Is anyone actively using ELN now? I'm gonna be honest, I didn't even know that was a thing um, until this meeting. I didn't know we had one. I was not sure that the DOI feature is already implemented. Uh, there should be an announcement. I think that's a big deal. Yeah, yeah just yeah, so I the picture. The, the posting one, no, the, the DOI one. I didn't realize that. So yeah, definitely putting out something to, to explain that. 
Also, I think we'd made a couple uh, changes to the, the formatting. Now we can add like videos and stuff. I've seen it uh, when I published uh, the, last, uh, the last piece. Also, I use it a lot as a kind of like a notebook. So like before posting comments, because like sometimes we have some bugs and uh, as we already uh, put it in the Slack, maybe you refresh the page, you lose the comment and so on. I normally write all the comment in the in a notebook, in an ELN, and then I just like copy and paste it on the on the on the main page. So it's kind of Oh yeah, I do that with my comments with a word processor because yeah, I've lost comments before, like early on. I was like, that's not happening again. Yeah. So yeah, it's super useful to to use it like that. So I kind of like open two pages and use it as a yeah, as a notebook. Anton? Um yeah, I um I, I think from from testing it, um there is some issues with uh, math type, I think. Um, so I think it would, I think I can only add formulas just like in a separate uh, line, but not in line. And, um, and in general, I, I also actually use it a lot for note taking. So, um, yeah, um, it would be cool to maybe have like a feature of maybe also saving papers, like I'm making a reading list in the ELN or something, because right now I keep track with a table or something of things. Um, and um, I think that it would be also cool to have the op opportunity to export to PDF. Um, if we have, I don't know how it's being done in the back end, um, depending, I mean, the coolest would be if it's like almost same like LaTeX or something in the back end. And then we could also make it like HTML friendly for the future. Um, but right now, I think what would be helpful is if I really legitimately write big documents on there and I want to share it with my professor, I I'm a bit more hesitant to send her the link to the research hub, um, but right now, sometimes it would be also great to introduce people by exporting to PDF. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. I think PDF export, we definitely need to have that. Um, so I'll add that to the list to report back. And then a couple of people have mentioned like ways to uh, kind of manage like different papers within the ELN. Um, one thing we talked about during our board meeting too is like, just like strategy wise, Research Hub's in kind of a weird spot where it's essentially a social app right now, but we're asking like professionals to spend their free time doing professional things on a social app without like the ability to get hired for a job or like really like earn grant, you know, funding. And so we want to, in theory, build like a way to get Research Hub more like into like the average academics workflow without them having to do something like outside of like what they're already doing day to day. So we mentioned this a little bit earlier, but like building a citation manager that essentially like when you use it, you're earning RSC for using it. And then like the data you input like through the citation manager can be reflected on researchhub.com. For instance, like if everybody's saving this new paper, that's really cool about like polypotent stem cells, that paper could go to the top of researchhub.com without people uploading it um, just based on like citation manager usage. And so, um, yeah, we're going to start to make designs on this just to like start to think about it from like, if we were to build it, what would we want to do? So yeah, if anybody has any thoughts on like a citation manager and how to like roll something out there that could be useful to help like bring new people into Research Hub, uh, definitely like keep, let it percolate in your brain because we'll be thinking about it a lot over the next like probably two to three months. Okay, uh, let's move on to maybe supplementing the ELN a little bit with uh, social activity of our own. If someone posts, wait, has anyone posted anything that is worthy of assigning DUI yet? I hope to kind of finish my perpetual review, one number one, as soon as possible, but it's taking Longer than expected because it's uh, some work, but yeah, I hope to be able to do that soon. So that will probably be my first experiment. Okay, well, that that's a great example. What do you all think we should do when this uh, when this is released? Should we tweet about it? Should we go all comment on it? What other ways we can support this little in the house uh, publishing? Anton. Um, okay, maybe that. Yeah, I mean, it, it is kind of with supporting. I, I'm wondering if you post this ELN and you make a post in terms of versioning, how this would work, right? In, in GitHub, we have pull requests, and um, we we can make issues or whatever. And how would this how would this go with publications right now? 
with the ELN, people can comment. But for instance, if they want to add something to Ricardo's perpetual review, right? Um, I forgot Ricardo detailed a lot of that stuff <laughs> in this post, but um, they get rewards for adding stuff. And how would that work? Do they comment and when Ricardo edits his own post in the next iteration or? So this is something we're actually building now as part of the peer review feature. We're going to have version control within the ELN. So like you'll be able to essentially like have like version 1.1, 1.2, et cetera, be able to track all the changes. And then we'll eventually plug peer review in where you can see like a peer reviewers comments between the changes of like version 1.3 to version 1.4. And so there's probably a way that we could use this within like Ricardo's perpetual review paradigm of like keeping track of like the versions and like who contributed what to like each like additional version. We're, we're thinking about it like very similarly to like GitHub issues essentially. Um, so it'll end up looking kind of like GitHub where people like, you know, make suggested contributions and then whoever like owns like the repo would be able to accept them, reject them, that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll probably need to iterate it or iterate on it a lot, but there's right now we're starting to build out like some kind of version control in the ELN. Uh, another feature that Thomas was excited about was like inline commenting in the ELN. So like, kind of like Google Docs, where if you want to like comment on someone's notes to give them feedback before they publish it like publicly, um, having some kind of like interactive ability there. So um, yeah, that's just another feature that we're thinking to make the ELN more robust. I'm a fan of uh, inline commenting, but I think you already said that you tried it out, but it was like a kind of some problems with that. But so yeah, I would love that. The problems before were from rendering PDFs in line. So like we could like take text from PDFs in theory, put them into our web page um, in order to work with like our inline commenting like uh, feature, essentially. You can't do it in the PDF itself. And so PDF extraction is a hard problem that nobody's solved yet when it comes to like machine learning. And so you can get like 85% accuracy, but the last 15% looks really bad. And so we just nixed it because that 15% looks really bad. So the idea here is we can bring it back um, for posts through the ELN because they'll be in a format that's compatible with the feature of like using inline commenting. So yeah, I think in theory, we eventually want to like, hopefully be able to render PDFs like in the web page, but until then have people like share stuff through the ELN and have that like output be something that you can have inline commenting on. Oh, great. really excited about the version control i think that's a unique value proposition right that currently doesn't exist the reviews are not open and the changes that are implemented are invisible for in the final product there's like a couple journals that do this like um journal of open source software actually uses github to like track all of their like peer review and they do it openly so so kind of like exactly what anton's suggesting and then um another one i really like is f1000 does a great job of like, uh, like they're a preprint server that shows the peer review status to like the right side of the page. They have a pretty interesting UI. So there are a couple people, I think doing this, but I agree, this is probably how all peer review should be done. Anton? Yeah, sorry, one thing that dropped into my mind is also, um, I think, can we, when, when working with figures, um, it's really cool that we have video or YouTube embedding works as well, but um, do we have, uh, like, can we add the text to the respective figures, like a subtext, like figure one? Um, I don't know. I think last time I missed it. Um, yeah, I think uh, just something we have to enable. Uh, it's a plugin. Yeah, so it shouldn't be too hard to add that. Oh, versioning sounds really cool. Okay. Thomas, do you have any like specific questions for everybody about the like the feature set for the ELN? Um, not right now. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, like, a bunch of different ideas, but the feedback so far has been really helpful already. Yeah, and again, if anybody, if ideas pop up, you know, feel free to DM me or DM Thomas because we'll we'll probably be working on refining the ELN for like the existence of research hub forever <laughs> so we'll keep we'll keep adding to it definitely send us ideas all right uh should we move on to the next item sounds good to me okay so 
a little bit of a discussion here about the meaning of things in Research Hub. I don't know if you have encountered the situation, but sometimes when I tell people about Research Hub and they, they get a little bit confused about uploading papers and some people instantly assume that you, you can only upload something that you own, right? Something that you have published yourself. And even if you have published it yourself, the, some people are not clear on whether you're allowed to publicly share it uh, like that or not. So it, it takes a little bit of uh, describing to let them know that it's not, you're not actually claiming what you are, you, you, you are posting, right? You, you are highlighting it that like, it's, you see, it's even awkward to describe what exactly are people doing when they upload papers on the research hub, not even uploading, but create entries for research hub. You should definitely have a solid language for this process that, you know, that's not to be confused with actually actions that make you own the content. What do you all think? How, how should we differentiate between submitting your content and kind of highlighting someone's content? So I think this is a super important distinction and I totally agree where like kind of the way that we have things now, like the user's profile picture, like on like the, the post, it, it sort of like intuitively suggests that they're the author. And so I think there's some UI things that we can do to help make this like more like clear. Um, I, I also think at the end of the day, like as long as most of the value is going to the author, like that's the most important thing. Um, and so, yeah, hopefully this new incentive structure is like a, a good step in the right direction here. But yeah, I guess so there's, there's UI changes we can make to help make that delineation, you know, more clear. But then do you, do you all think there's like some instructions we need to add? Like when people post, like how's the best way to help to, to clear up some of the confusion around, like, can I post this paper? Shared by, I like it. Yeah, shared by is good. That's a, that's a good idea. So I guess what one aspect is how how is the poster viewed on the user interface when they post or share share a uh, you know an article that they didn't themselves author. But then I guess the other thing is that we should maybe put more emphasis on the actual authors and in some way display if we can where they're from, who they are, what their background is, if possible. Because, you know, within a, a, a fame, uh, within a hub, within an area of interest, you've got some of the same names coming up and maybe there should be some ways of, you know, being able to easily link to other posts on Research Hub that are linking to papers authored by the same person, if that makes sense. So, so are you suggesting like at this part of the paper page, we change the UI to put more of the focus onto the authors and their background, or maybe have these like be able to be clicked into and see more about them? Or my, my preference, and I don't know what other people think, but um, I think there's a, a certain interface that people are used to when you go on a journal website where underneath the title are the actual authors of the paper. And then in the, you know, in the tabs on the right, we could have the poster. But I think, yeah, I think the author should be listed underneath the title. I actually like that. Yeah, this is where shared by should go. And then the author should be here with like a minimize. And then you can see Johns Hopkins, you know, like uh, the Sorbonne or whatever. Like Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a really great suggestion. Malik? Oh yeah, I was just going to say that I really like that, that the author should be below the paper. And I think when we, when we are trying to like post the, post the paper, you know, like we, we put the title and then we choose the hubs, maybe create like a section where we can just put the name of the authors there itself. And then when you post it, the, the name of the authors just, or, or if this can be done in backend automatically, just like PubMed has, um, Either way, like, you know, uh, if you want us to do it manually, then we can do that way too. But I really like if we put the authors underneath the, the title of the paper and just post it by on the right side. Yeah, yeah I like the paper, it. The author add-in process is a little bit unoptimized right now, right? Because if, if the paper, if, if Research Hub fails to extract the author names automatically, you can't just manually write them in. You have to create profile for each author before you can add them to the to the paper. Uh, so that's 
perhaps it would be better if it lists the placeholder text without the uh, without the profile would be created that could be especially important since now the pots of gold the the, the rec accumulated for offers will be more prominent I guess that would be more important that we keep the identity of the offers attached to the uh, papers. Actually, I would be curious to look at, are there any statistics on the number of papers on the research hub that do not have the offers inputted yet? Oh, like missing the metadata? Mm -hmm. We can pull that. It just anecdotally, I bet it's like 10%. Mm -hmm. But yeah, apparently pull, pulling authors is a like non-trivial technical challenge. And so like we have kind of like an 80-20 solution that will definitely not like cover all of the issues. And yeah, I think it's it's gonna be basically like people complain and then we fix issues. And, and we luckily, you know, have the coins to to make sure everybody receives what they deserve, even if we have technical issues. Um but yeah, it's it's a challenging thing, and we'll actually probably there are a couple of groups doing like decentralized identification for researchers to help like make this like a little bit easier. But yeah, it's it's going to be something we'll have to work on, you know, to get it right. Uh, yeah, yeah. Do we have a sense of the percentage of authors who claim their RC tokens? Uh, of the total papers, I can. So, so far, um, since we've changed to like a paper based, um, like claim 197 have been claimed so far. And I'd say that's maybe yeah. like, like mainly four or five different authors. And then like a couple of editors, like Sprinkton grabbing individual papers, but it's, it's semi exciting to me. Cause like just in the last week or so, we've had like a couple of like non research hub affiliated researchers come in and like one guy even uploaded like 150 of his own papers. He said he spent the entire weekend doing oh, that's it. That's great. Claimed them all. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Another person yesterday, like some astrophysicist claimed like a solid 30 something. So it's, it's starting to like pick up a little bit. Um, and I think, yeah, once, once we make more progress on like the marketplace side for the token, hopefully it'll be even more like attractive for people to come in. Jennifer? Yeah, hello. Um, I was wondering, so I think um, for, I usually um, upload from IEEE and I don't think the authors are ever automatically uploaded. So um, are, is the recommendation for us to manually input those right now? Or um, yeah, I wasn't sure what so, so we, we should be doing. Th thanks for bringing that up because there are like specific journals that we have trouble with and we can mm -hmm. build like you know case by case like kind of like uploading help so if you're uploading a lot of IEEE like we can mm -hmm. we can figure out how to make sure that we grab all the metadata from those papers specifically we just you know to help make it more convenient um we're, we're thinking about this because we're fixing the paper upload flow right now to make it simpler essentially and one of the issues that we have is thinking about like, if we can't grab metadata, like what's the UX? Like, do we ask the like submitting user to go in and add it manually, or do we just post it without authors and hope they do? We, we don't have a great solution here. So we'd be curious to hear what everybody says, but like, just like from my own perspective, we, we have like hot jar and some, like I can like go in and like see like user behavior on research hub. And like nothing frustrates me more than when like a really smart person is just wasting their time <laughs> in like, like, you know, author data. Like that's such a waste of, like, it's not the intention of why we have people here. We want them to like, you know, not be doing manual labor, like doing stuff that's like hard and like, yeah. So I think it's, it's not respectful to people's time to have them be adding in like authors themselves. I think dework bounties could totally work like for like, you know, a lay person to be able to come in and like transcribe names. I think that's a great idea. Um, but yeah, we, in my mind, it's a high priority to make sure that we get the metadata like accurately. So that way people aren't, you know, people spend their time like reading papers and sharing commentary rather than like just adding in uh, metadata. Okay. So for now, um, you wouldn't advise us to necessarily go back to all the old papers we've already uploaded and <laughs> manually enter in all the authors or anything like that. Okay. No, definitely don't. We'll be able to at some point retrospectively do it. And like okay. if authors like, you know, see their paper and their research coin and they want uh, rewards, we'll be able to manually do it for people. Like if there's any issues with the like actual distribution of stuff. Uh, Nathan? 
Yeah, I was just going to, um, a thought came into my head when you were talking about how some of these authors have done a great job of uploading their entire archive of papers um, in one go. I think that the, the, that's great. Uh, but the thing is that now the way that the site works is that a lot of those papers will probably get missed in terms of the, the posts and the way that it's working, because if they all get uploaded in one go, it's very unlikely that people are going to be able to sift through and actually get, get to it. And I suspect you know, as Research Hub, you know, gains popularity, gains users and gains, most importantly, existing researchers with large archives. I think that will be a, a more common issue where, you know, they'll, they'll they'll be really excited, upload all their papers <laughs> and then most of them will probably just get lost in the ether. And maybe maybe there's, there's got to be some solution to that, maybe through highlighting existing papers that you've uploaded over time and uh, things like that. I'm not sure. So this is a super great point. I'm really glad you brought that up. Like one thing we could do is add, like has this paper been claimed to the hot score? So in theory, like if you claim a paper, your paper is going to the top, you know, of the homepage and like, we'll have like a little button on it that says, you know, authors here, like ask a question. Like we could try and direct people to papers claimed by authors to try and start those conversations. That's a awesome idea. Would it be better baked into the hot score or maybe another filter? where it's like you can sort by author claimed posts if you just want to like see only author claimed stuff. Ricardo? Yeah, that's that's a great point, Ethan. I, I think another uh, cool idea could be when we are actually going to uh, create some content, some original content on Research Hub, and maybe tagging some papers that are already a Research Hub, uh, maybe bringing them up again. Let's say you make a review uh by tagging some papers they come up again so you're gonna give live to the papers again and you kind of like bring them up yeah totally it's a great point this it it the more i think about the citation manager the more it just makes perfect sense because it's like the best way to track like what papers are people using like not even like what are they sharing it's like what literally are people reading right now what are they using i, I know um like mendeley uses like that kind of data for their altmetric like Elsevier, you know, whatever has like altmetric score and they use citation manager data in it. It's like, that's cool, but it's all proprietary. So they don't share it at all. So I think we could do something open, which would be nice. Um, Molly. Yeah, I was just gonna mention a point about like, when you mentioned that how we can, how if authors have claimed then that paper would show more on like the, oh, like if you can sort it that way. But the other way to sort that I still haven't found on research of is like, yeah, if I post a paper today that was published three years ago, you know, it's still showing in the newest. Uh, I mean, and then that research is already like three years old. Um, not that that makes it necessarily good or bad, but at some point, you know, that data is getting outdated. Um, and, um, you know, if I, if I post my paper that I published in undergrad, that's like 10 years ago, then, um, you know, there is more data that has come out since then. And I think research up can benefit from those latest papers more than my paper from that time. So there's some way to search that, you know, like, like let's say disease pemphigus to the latest research comes up first, um, or at least you can sort it that way, you know. It reminds me of like DOAJ, it's like the open access search uh, um, kind of engine. You can search by like most relevant or like most recently published. Um, yeah, I totally agree. I guess like same question, should it be a filter or should that just automatically be counted into the hot score? Like where we just try and have more recent papers up at the top. I, I was just thinking filter, but I mean, what everybody, whatever everybody thinks, I mean, yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Nathan? Yeah, I just wanted to share a uh, an idea that I had partly related to this and then also a content idea see what people think where if we notice that uh, we've got a researcher that's uploaded their entire archive or something like that could we perhaps invite them to write a post on research hub which basically says something like hi uh, this is my name i've just joined research hub this is a summary of my research to this date and then they can themselves in one post say this is what i've been working on these issues these issues these issues these are the key papers that i've published in these areas this is where you should start with with me and then invite people to ask them questions i think i think that could be a really great way of celebrating someone coming onto research hub 
sharing their research with them and then letting them signpost people to the most important papers they've published rather than you know leaving it to the algorithm or whatever i i think that could be quite a cool idea i, I don't know what people think i love it i think that's it's like kind of brilliant where if you're willing to take the time on your weekend to upload all your papers if we have like an ambassador who reaches out and is like whoa this is awesome you're so cool like more people want to like hear from you like you can do this stuff and like even we can get our community to start to share your papers around which might have like a professional benefit for you um yeah this is awesome i'm, I'm thinking like with jeff and ricardo are working on like a, a structure of like working groups where we can start to help to like uh, organize like some more individual effort when it comes to like managing some of these like sort of outreach tasks. So I'm thinking like a, a working group that's almost like community relations is the wrong word, but like a like a welcome party to like help make like new people on Research Hub feel engaged, like reach out to them and be like, this isn't just an app, you're part of a community now, here are the people like we all want to help you and stuff. Like I think that's a, a really cool like positive like community feeling thing. Um, so yeah, we should totally do a working group on that. I think we should also issue them an NFT. Um, like if you upload all that stuff, we should issue an NFT and then highlight, like we don't understand all the characteristics of this NFT, but the DAO could vote on the characteristics or like what benefits people who do that early on get. Um, I think that'd be pretty um, good, so. Yeah, totally. We're, we're definitely excited about that. Kind of the, the V1 of the NFT that we're thinking is pretty much that. Where like if you publish really? through the ELN or if you claim a paper, you can say, hey, I want an NFT with this. And like we just give you an NFT and help you sell it on OpenSea if you want to. Um, and then we'll, we'll iterate from there to like make it cooler and have like fun incentives behind the NFTs. But yeah, that's, that's the V1 of like, if you're the person who did this work, do you want to mint it? You know, do you want a collectible with it? Um, but yeah, Edmund, I'll, I'll loop you into those conversations that we're having design wise. Cause like, yeah, we're, we're trying to think through NFTs like deeply over the next three months or so. So if you want to join in, I can, I can loop you into some of the, the chats we're having around that. Yeah. That'd be great. Cool. Yeah, for sure. Nick. Just real quick too. You could also do like an NFT for, you know, this person's uploaded or 10 pay or 50 or a hundred, like a tiered kind of reward, you know, so they could have that, that rep directly attached to them. Yeah, totally. I think, yeah, and NFTs we think are like pretty exciting and there's like a shit ton of potential. And yeah, we just, we want to make sure that we do it the right way and don't want to like, you know, half step into something without it being yeah, fully thought totally. through. So yeah, we want to take our time and like, yeah, the, the more feedback and really the critical feedback that we can get here, like we'll end up building something that like in theory will be appealing, you know, to even people who don't, you know, aren't NFT centric. Um, is there a good idea? Because, uh, you know, I'm assuming a lot of people here go through different products. And I don't know, setting up a space, perhaps, where people just talk about different kinds of NFT tokenomics that they're seeing. Because things that happen in gaming could be relevant for, you know, a wide range of uh, industries, let's say, could be relevant to models that work for us. So just having something where people can talk about interesting models might actually be pretty useful. Yeah, I love it. Can I jump in here, Patrick, actually? there. Uh, so um, me and Ricardo and Iridi have been like working on setting up, um, so a Discord. Um, so I, so the idea is the Slack is like a lot more like science native. Uh, so a lot of like academics yeah. prefer Slack, but a lot of like the crypto native people use Discord and Discord like has this role system and it's really good for working groups. So we have the Discord set up um, where we're just working on like adjusting like moderation, um, like restrictions and things like that. Um, but we have working groups set up in there and um, we'll definitely take a lot of feedback on like which extra working groups you guys think we should incorporate or where certain things can get plugged into. And the Discord will be very, very well integrated into DWORK. So you can reward people directly uh, doing bounties from those working groups in DWORK. So, um, it's like pretty much almost set up so just stay tuned for that and like please give it like feed any feedback you can about that send it over to me and ricardo and, and we'll do it all right we are a little bit over an hour now uh we haven't talked about the upload style votes and the digitalized title yet but perhaps a longer discussion here is warranted do you want to yeah. 
Kobe wanted to join this one too, right? I think it's okay pushing that to next week. Okay, sounds good. Uh, just a little quick uh, something about the offer versus poster before we adjourn. Even in the upload, uh, even the new paper upload process, it, the name for the action is you upload the paper, which I think might be a little bit misleading because you don't actually upload anything sometimes, right? Maybe share, but share also implies that it's yours to share. Hmm. I think share is a big improvement over upload. So yeah, we can do that, and then we can we can go from there. But share is more like, "Hey, world, take this," mm -hmm. you know, rather than like claiming ownership. Yeah. All right. Any final thoughts before we adjourn the meeting? I like the energy of this meeting more than some of the other ones. So it's good stuff. <laughs> yeah, this one's been amazing. There's so many good ideas that came out. Thank you guys. Thanks everybody. This is yeah. Pretty, pretty like exciting in general. I must have missed the toxic ones. Then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, well, thank you, Edwin.